All right. How did uh, my last couple weeks go for everybody else? You'll know how my last couple weeks were. But... Yeah. Good. 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 How'd the assignment go? A couple of vocab things we didn't get to in class, but they're easy concepts, right? The stuff we'd already talked about. We just we just had to put the term theoretical yield or limiting reactive to it yet. But it was nothing we hadn't talked about. Um, so I didn't think that that was too big of a leap for everybody. Um, was there anything from the ICA anybody wanted to go over? Here you go. Uh, to yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Did everybody find the part on the key they talked about to me? Yeah. All right. But just so that I'm not redriving it from scratch, let's just work through it by looking at the key, um, which would be helpful and important to you. So the trickiest thing about this is, is it's a system of equations where two of your equations have to come from the balanced stoichiometry, which is it's part of the trickiest part. So let me pull other areas. Find all. Yes. All right, so the first two may, should make a fair bit of sense. There's, we've written stoichiometry problems like this before. What's trickiest about it, and probably the number two is the easiest one, right? Because it just said at the end, you have 1.7 times more, or you have the amount of water, moles of water, is 1.75 times the, the um, moles of CO2. So that's a straight up ratio. You can write it like this, you can write it like a ratio, where you write 1.75 equals moles of water over moles of CO2. Either way, we've seen that one, right? This one's a little trickier, especially because we want to do everything in terms of moles because that's what we wrote for right here, and that's how we start doing the equations. So, with that in mind, we kind of we basically this is kind of a condensed form of go to whiteboard. Because we could say. That's gonna make me do this. Is it 3.0 grams? The mass of methane <laughs> plus the mass of is it propane the other one? So that also is something we've done before, right? Where it gets tricky is we don't want masses, we want moles. So as a conversion, if we had, if I said one gram of methane, how many moles is that? That's easy to do as a conversion, right? Easy enough to say 1.0 grams of CH4, use the molecular weight, right? 16 point whatever gram CH4 is one mole. Well, what if instead of having a mass, mass what mass? Right there, right? So moles of, so we can get moles of CH4 is equal to the mass of CH4 divided by the molecular weight, right? Or we could rearrange that and then we could just do a substitution into the, this easy equation we had, right? So if we rewrote this, we could say, Moles of CH4 is equal to the molecular weight. Actually, no, we already did that. I had that backwards. Hang on. Yeah. 
is equal to mass of CH4 times one over 0.05. And if we wanted to put that in there, we would just multiply both sides by the molecular weight, right? So now that I say that out loud, I think I have written the, the key might have that equation backwards. Oh, it has it on the top. Never mind. It's good. So because this term that's equal to mass of H4. And this term is equal to mass of propane. So really you could write it as six equations, six unknowns might have actually been the easier way to get to all the equations. Seems more intimidating, right? But coming up with this on your own is really tricky. But the pieces that go into it are really easy. What I have written as equation one is really mass one plus mass two equals three. And Mass one is equal to molecular weight one times moles. And just simplify ones and twos to make room here. And mass two is molecular weight two times moles two. So all that, you get this. Yeah, not something I would expect you to come up with on a timed test. Something similar to this. It's pretty fair game for the take home, but I'm not going to give you anything totally new for the take home that you've never seen anything like it. Um, so, in my a new elements here or there, but th even this would be a stretch one, even on the take home. <laughs> Excuse me. All right, so then the others. These ones actually just come straight from the stoichiometry. And when I say by that, I mean, I mean from the balanced reaction. Because right? if we say, okay, well, I'm burning methane and I'm burning propane. That means that the only two things that are producing water are these two reactions, right? Let's see, and it winds up being if that's balanced if I'm remembering correctly. And then for the propane, C3H8 plus if I'm going from memory, five oxygens goes to four waters and three CO2s. So this one's a little bit weird, but if we're just trying to talk about in terms of moles of water and moles of CO2, we know that all of our water is coming from one of these two reactions, right? So we can say total moles of water at the end is equal to the moles of water from, from we call that reaction one, moles of water from reaction two. Well, we can rewrite these in terms of moles of methane and propane, right? So we can say, okay, well, our total moles of water is going to be two times our moles of our methane we started with and four times our moles of propane. So again, bit of a stretch to see that until you've seen this trick once, right? It's like it's like a lot of the algebra tricks that you see in, in math classes. Once you've seen it, it maybe it's not easy 
But once you've seen it, you could replicate it. By having never seen this before, this was a really hard problem. Three out of the four equations that you needed were kind of hard to get to. Right, and then, but then doing the same thing for CO2 is pretty straightforward, right? <laughs> so any any parts in particular still stick out as something you want me to go over? You can use the system of equations then I guess it's good. So the, once you get the equations written, once you realize that you're you got your four variables are moles of propane, moles of methane, moles of water, moles of CO2, right? Once you have that figured out, the easiest way to do it is to keep doing a, is to do a bunch of substitution. It's going to be looking a little, a little bit messy. It'll take you a lot of steps if you're doing it by hand, but it's it's doable to just do it like that. So, and what I mean by that is, got one point seven five. Moles of water, if I'm remembering that right. Or did I switch those of oh, CO2? Switch those. And we had the 3.0 grams. Well, 16.0 times moles of methane and is it 44? Um, yeah. That is the molecular weight of propane? 46. 36 and 844. So those are just those, just those molecular weights written without the units just to condense it a little bit. So our four variables are all in these first two equations, and then we can say moles of H2O equals two times moles of methane. Plus four times moles of propane and moles of CO2. One ends up being moles of methane plus three times moles of propane. So once they're all written out like this, four equations, the four unknowns are the, the variables that are left in there. One of them is already solved for. We could just take this. And plug it in here. And then we get something where we can start to simplify it and solve for moles of CO2, set it up equal to moles of CO2 again. Right, the, the way that I would look at these four equations, say, okay, one, what's going to give me the fewest additions once I start doing substitutions? Because additions and foiling and things like that is messy. I don't want to deal with that. So my first thought is. Well, that's already a really simple equation. Let's start by summing that in somewhere. So make one of the others and put it in. What I would naturally go to would be to put it in here. And then we can simplify that again to get moles of CO2 is equal to 2 over 1.75 moles of methane plus 4 over 1.75 moles of propane 
All I did there was I subbed this in here and then I divided both sides by 1.75 to solve the moles of CO2 again. Now I've got this equation, which is equal to moles of CO2, and this equation is equal to moles of CO2. I can set them equal to each other. And I can take this and just plug it in there. So now we've used three of our four equations, right? We used this one. We used our moles of water equation. We subbed it into our moles of CO2 equation. And now we get two over 1.75 moles of methane plus four over 1.75. Moles of propane equals moles of methane plus three times moles of propane. And that you don't have to leave these as the decimals or as the fractions here. I tend to leave them as fractions just so I can see where all the numbers came from. So I can look at this and say, oh, my 1.75 came from equation one, and the two and the four came from, from the stoichiometry from the balancing. Okay, that's, that's almost enough to solve it right there. Okay. All you have to do now is combine my terms. We've got one more equation left, substitute in. Like I said, it's a bunch of substituting. But the, sub the nice thing about system of equations is substituting will always work. Solve for a variable, plug it into one of your equations and simplify. Then solve for another variable, plug it into another equation and simplify. And you just keep doing that until you get a number as an answer, until you've used all your equations. Once you've seen how to do that, though, in reality, once you can write those four equations, plugging it into a solver is usually going to be faster. <laughs> and I guess, especially once you get here, where you're down to just two equations, two unknowns, plugging, it, plugging these two equations into a solver is pretty straightforward if you, if you switch out moles of methane and moles of propane for just x and y just make sure you keep track of which is x and which is y that's pretty easy to type in in wolfram alpha and just hit solve and so if we say let's call moles of methane it's x and moles of propane equals y just because wolfram alpha the angle subscripts particularly well, or at least I don't know how to make it do that. Now we can just open up over an alpha. And most of the TIs from like TI 84s and, and above have a solver built into it. You have to learn how to use it, but if you've, if you've taken some of the math classes here, you may have learned how to use the solver already, um, in which case it's just a matter of knowing how to plug it in. But in this case, was what was three equals 16.05 times X plus 24.01. Times Y. And then we had Two over 1.75 times X plus four over 1.75 times Y equals X plus three Y, right? So there's our molecular weights equation. This is our combined form with the stoichiometry and the 1.75. Gives us numbers for X and Y. 
x is 0.2, y is 0.02. That gives us moles. And once you have moles, getting grams is easy. That is, in fact, what it shows here. Nothing like really hot water with honey when you have a sweet throat. All right. Did that answer your question a little bit? Yeah. yeah. Okay. But that's the basics of the, the system of equations. It's pretty much always going to come back to yeah. if you wrote your equations right, it just do a bunch of substituting until all your, your equations combine. You know, and all your, your variables fall out and you're left with just. You know, x equals a number or y equals a number. And once you get one of them, as soon as you get one of those variables, it doesn't even really matter what we solve for. Because as soon as we get one of those variables, getting any of the others is pretty easy. If something about the way I did the substitution means I actually saw moles of CO2, and that was I got a number for moles of CO2 first. Well, as soon as I can get moles of CO2, I can get moles of water. And as soon as I can get moles of water and moles of CO2, I can come in down here and substitute, right? It might be more algebra, depending on which, what the four equations are exactly. Um, sometimes it's, it's a, a lot of extra work if you accidentally solve for the wrong variable first. You still then have to go and do a bunch more substitution again. But it's just plug and chug it that way. Once you know what one of them is, plug it in there, start getting numbers for the rest of them. <laughs> All right. So I don't think I think given the weather and my voice, everything else, I think we'll just do some more practice with stoichiometry today. We won't get into gas laws today, which will mean our lab next week, you We'll be seeing some concepts in gas laws for the first time. We've we've done that in lab before, right? Um, and it'll be kind of fun because we actually get to do some of the the um, experiments that um, you know going into them blind, so to speak, just like somebody back in the 1600s would have been for the first time discovering what pressure was and how pressure and volume were linked. Edward, is that the last thing we're going to do? The last thing for this quarter is going to be gas loss, and we're we're even not even have enough time to really do it total justice, but that'll set you up for for the winter quarter and be able to go into that. So yeah, that'll be our last topic. Will be gas loss, um, and we'll do. I'm going to show you a bunch of the classical gas loss, what they call the simple gas loss, kind of really fast. We're going to skip over a bunch of, of, um, of example problems because there's really only one form when you're in gen chem, especially there's only really one equation that really matters that much when it comes to gases. And so we're just going to go through the derivation of PV equals NRT, which is one of the, it's, it's gen chem's version of, of force equals mass times acceleration. It just, if you know that and you see Gases, you know right away I'm using PV equals NRT. So we'll get to that, and that'll be our last topic that we cover next next Tuesday. So before we get, I have, some, I have more practice problems here. Um, are there any other ones in particular from the ICA that you would rather go over first? 
Yeah, Chase. Uh, I think for one of them, I think it's two C. You with a uh, I'm a key, you might I think you used a different density. Oh, I think yeah. provided on the example. Yeah, I think you did it wrong. That's certainly possible. I think I solved the same way and got it uncomfortable with it, but I just wanted to check to make sure. Let me the Dropbox changed how to get all my files all of a sudden um, on my own web form. Um, so let me actually just open it up in Canvas. So I'm looking at the same thing. Also, uh, while I'm pulling this up, I have um, a meeting with uh, all of the adjuncts and the other chemistry instructors and lab managers um, that are going to be doing the rest of the Gen Chem series um, at uh, three today. Um, so I want to make sure I, I ask all the questions that everybody in this class wants to hear. Um, so if you think of any specific anything specifically that you want to like, um, you want some clarification on what it's going to look like next quarter. Um, you know, you'll have a syllabus day and everything to go over everything with that. But if there's anything in particular um, that's uh, been making you nervous, um, write it down. Let me know at the end of class today, and, uh, and I'll make sure I ask those questions. Is 2C? Uh, yes. So if I'm remembering this one right. So 2D winds up looking a little bit like a trick question because you get the same amount of energy out of it, whether it's propane or methane, just based on the way that I wrote the problems. That could have that could be part of what the issue is. Um, let me pull up the key as well. So we're looking at the same thing there. I think, um, so D depends on C. Yes. One that I, I think there is a mistake. Okay. So C, five gallons. Is that 0 0.226? It's yeah. 0 0.361. Okay. Yeah, I just used the, I don't know where that number came from. Okay, well, that's, Based on the density of the propane, I don't know where this number came from, but the density of the propane makes more sense. The density of methane should be about, should not be a factor of 10 times smaller than the density of the, of the propane. So my guess is that this, this number is wrong, 0 0.03. Um, I probably copied and pasted it wrong from somewhere because this number makes more sense to me. But either way, all that would really change would be would be that that conversion factor, right? So from a logic point of view, um, it, that shouldn't change anything too much. What's the number that you get for? And so what's what's your number in terms of kilojoules for part D for that propane? Was uh, three point four two times ten to the fourth. 
It's been 34,200. Okay. Yeah, I don't, I don't know. I don't know where that number came from. It's been a while. Yeah. Look that key. Um, so, but good catch. That's, that's where the difference is. Any, anything else in particular from the ICA? We won't get marked down for using the numbers that were given to no, us. No. Um, and really the only, the only other trick to stoichiometry at this point is occasionally you wind up with having to get either creative or find another way to get to moles somehow. Right. But once you have a balanced reaction, finding theoretical yield is the same every time. Finding your only reactive is the same every time. The only time it gets the only thing that gets tricky is occasionally you start seeing um, different methods of getting to moles. So for mass, mass using molecular weight, that's easy. If, I, if you have a pure substance and you have you know, if I say you have, think back to the Lake Tahoe problem um, in the ICA, where we said, okay, here's the volume of Lake Tahoe, how many moles are in it? Well, you had to get to grams first, but then it was just using molecular weight again, right? The other most common way of getting to moles Is a concentration in the <laughs> of a solution. So, but it works the same way. So let's practice this. We've got a solid and we've got a solution. Two different ways of getting the moles. Figure out how many moles you have of each, and figure out what runs out first. Like the way of magnesium hydroxides around 50. Mm -hmm. One thing, one thing, right? Uh, and getting to most from a solution looks a little different, but it's, it's basically just one extra conversion to get to liters first. Mm -hmm. and then, then it's actually easier. You're given a concentration of molarity, you don't even need to worry about molecular weights. And so 500 meters. And for every thousand milliliters, you get one liter. I guess what I'm glossing over here, how does the concentration get us to moles? How do we do that? It's moles over liters equals molarity. That's moles over liters. 
So that means that is the conversion. Let's say one liter is 0 0.700 zero zero moles. So that makes it really obvious why chemists like to use molarity as their concentration unit, right? Yeah, it makes making the concentrations a bit of a pain, but it means that once you have that concentration, you don't need to go look up any molecular weights or anything to figure out what it's about. Everything you have is just on the front label of that, that solution. So, any any issues to this point? Yeah, then I'm going to clean it up and rewrite these underneath each of those. So what runs out first? Magnesium. So this is the part where I want to caution everybody because the temptation, once you get everything in moles, the temptation is to just look at this and say, oh, I have fewer moles of magnesium. I must run out of magnesium first. But that only works if it's being used at a one-to-one -one rate. This is being used at a two-to-one -one rate. So even though we have more HCl, we're using it up twice as fast. So we don't just need more HCl, we need, we need more than twice as much, which we do have. So magnesium hydroxide is running out first, but you always got to double check that. And if it's not, if you don't have really clean numbers, where it's easy to look at it and see, oh, obviously this is less than double, or obviously this is more than double the other one, or if it's a three to two ratio or something like that, it can be really a pain, or it's really easy to mess yourself up doing that. So the way that you can always figure out what's gonna run out first is, is the, to write it out in stoichiometry. Right, so because we can say, okay, well, if I use up all my magnesium hydroxide, how much HCl am I going to use? So we can say 0.164 moles HCl, or sorry, moles of magnesium hydroxide. And for every one mole here, two moles HCl used. When you do this, There's only three possible outcomes. Either using up all actant A gives you a number that's less than what you actually have for reactant B, or you're going to get a number that's more than what you have for reactant B. Or you could, within sig figs, get them perfectly canceling out and have them be equal to each other. That happens occasionally. I pick the numbers very carefully. You could wind up with both of the reactants being used up at the exact same time. In which case, we wouldn't really say there's one limiting reactant. Uh, within sig figs, we would just say that they're, I'm not even sure what the, the right way to phrase it. They're being used to completion or something like that. In this case, 
we wound up saying, okay, well, using all my magnesium hydroxide uses 0.32 moles of HCl, which is less than what I actually have to start with. In other words, magnesium hydroxide runs out first. Just for the sake of showing what it looks like the other way, let's say, okay, I'm going to use up all of my HCl. And for every two moles of HCl, that's one mole of magnesium hydroxide. You get something like 175, right? And we only have 0 0.164 moles of magnesium hydroxide to start with. So if you ever do these calculations and you say, okay, well, to use up all my HCl, I need 0.175 moles of magnesium hydroxide and I don't have it. That also tells you what runs out first, right? It tells you that you're gonna have leftover HCl because you can't actually use all of your HCl because you run out of magnesium hydroxide first. In other words, you have enough hamburger buns to make 175 hamburgers, but you only have enough patties to make 164. So therefore, you're running out of the patties first, right? When it, it always pays to think about these as they're just logic problems. All we're doing with these with these this stoichiometry steps is just kind of organizing our thoughts so I can say, okay, if this is what I have, this is what I'm making, does that make sense? It's the does that make sense that's going to really, really help you. Right? Because it's really easy to get lost when we start to come, you know, dealing with them as being abstract chemicals like magnesium hydroxide. For, at least for for some people, some people this makes tons of sense, and I've been going on for you know a whole lecture at this point of something that's like intuitive to you. If you can think about these chemicals as just being objects, this is really straightforward stuff. That's something that's tricky for a lot of people. That's why I spend so much time harping. All right, so we know what the limiting reactant is now. And we want to know, excuse me. The second question is just a theoretical yield question. Instead of what's running out first, how much product can we make? really just a different way of framing the same question, really, right? Instead of, instead of, am I gonna run out of hamburger buns or patties first, it's how many hamburgers can I make? Really the same question, if you think about it, right? The question depends on what's the balancing look like and what are my initial conditions? How much stuff do I have to start with? So if I want to know how many grams of magnesium chloride can be produced from this reaction, once we know the limiting reactants, we can ignore the excess reactant for now. Because this is the one that's going to be controlling everything. That's the one that's going to run out of first. And it's even a nice neat 
one to one ratio for product, right? So 0.164 moles of magnesium hydroxide. One mole reactants, one mole product, and then since it asked about grams, we just have a quick molecular weight to throw onto the end, magnesium chloride. So one mole magnesium chloride is kind of time out. To be really close to 100. And if you wanted to stop in between these two steps and get moles of magnesium chloride and then do the molecular weight, again, totally fine. I don't care that you do it all in one step. Because just because I like to plug it all into my calculator all in one step, because I find that to be easy once you get the hang of it, um, or just faster. So this last one is really the part that is the most interesting question on here, because it's one that looks a little bit different than what we've seen before. And so in this case, we're going to have to do a little subtraction problem. And the logic for it is one of those things, again, makes a lot of sense once you, if you're thinking about it right, but it's hard to see it until you've seen it done. If we want to know the concentration of HCl after the reaction, we want to know what's left. So go back to our answer. Analogy. If we're running out of patties first, that means we're going to have extra buns, right? This question is asking how many buns are left over. So you've got to figure out what's used and subtract it from what you started with. Again, mathematically not tricky. It's the logic and the in the thinking of how to set it up that trips people up. If we know that we've got 100 or 0.164 moles, the magnesium hydroxide, we already actually found this number, but let's go through it again. If we want to know how many moles of HCl are going to get used, it's two to one ratio. And this is one that once you see, once you see the logic and you get really good at this to the point where there's no possible way that you could mix it up, I'm okay with you doing a two to one ratio in your head. As long as you, as long as you write out the number. Like if you can look at this and say, okay, well, it's a two to one ratio, therefore I'm gonna double that number. And that's how much HCL is gonna get used up. I'm okay with you writing, just writing that number as long as you get it right. If you get it wrong and I don't know where the number came from, I can't give you as much partial credit. So it's a good idea to show your work, even for these really simple math steps um, for right now. One mole of magnesium hydroxide, two moles HCl used. So that gives us. Point three two eight moles of HCl used. If we want to know how many moles of HCl are left, well, take what we have initially, subtract what's subtract the change, or we can think of it as as adding the difference if you wanted to. We're using up this much. 
So intuitively, you should be able to look at that and say, oh, it's, that should be a subtraction, right? You don't wind up with more hamburger patties or more hamburger buns when you're done making hamburgers than you had when you started, right? Doesn't make any sense. So we want our final moles of HCl. So you write moles left, moles excess. Did I do that math right? I think I did. Yeah. Okay. <clears throat> Again, it's another case of the math in chemistry is exceedingly simple. Knowing what math steps to do is the trickiest part. So that gives us how many moles of HCl are left. We want the concentration of HCl at the end. Just one more step, right? I need a concentration. Moles over liters, right? The liters didn't change. We took 10 grams of a solid, we threw it into half a liter. It sold out half a liter. Within sig figs, we're just going to assume that we add a solid to a liquid. The volume of the liquid doesn't change. It's a decent assumption under normal circumstances. I was just a little confused about that because there's water being a resultant. So doesn't that like somehow change the volume? So how many moles of water are we gonna make? We're gonna make this many moles of water, right? Yeah. If you look at the concentration of water in itself, it's about 55 moles per liter. So adding 0.3 moles to 20 moles that are already in there, and maybe it'll change it a little bit. Likely, you'll get a bigger fluctuation um, just from the fact that this is exothermic reaction. And that's going to change the density of the water, frankly. So, but within sig figs, we're just going to assume that the water is what we're making as a product is not going to change it either. But a good question. All right, so we're assuming our volumes are. If you really wanted to, to see, we're only going to get two sig figs in our final answer anyway. If we went to all the trouble of looking at, okay, we made an extra 0.3 moles, how many grams is that? How many? And then use the density of water to figure out how many extra milliliters we added. We could do that. We know all the steps to do that. It's going to wind up being the same answer within sig figs, though. Although it probably is going to be just barely off. So if you if you want to convince yourself, do those steps um, after class today, and then come back next week and tell me how close it was or not close. But I wager it's within 10%. So we got 0 0.022. Moles of HCl left and 0 0.500 liters of our solution. So our final concentration of HCl is just going to be 0 0.044. You could write moles per liter, or even better, capital M. Where did the point five liters come from? Oh. No, just because we started with with a solution that was half a liter.
and just really, let's see, so an extra 0.3 moles, 0.3 times 18 is close to six. We get an extra six milliliters of water, roughly, when we do this. So 0 0.022 divided by 0 0.506, it's gonna be really close to divided by 0 0.500. You can wind up with some extreme cases, especially if you're taking upper upper division science classes or working in a lab where you dealt with you know, some of these, these cases that are at the extreme where these assumptions aren't valid. You just, that lab would have its own series of, of assumptions that they make. They wouldn't assume the volume doesn't change. They would assume that the density is a constant or something like that instead. Um, but you would just you would learn that when you spent time in that lab, working in, in that in that sphere. Yeah, I just didn't even know. I guess it makes a small difference, but I thought maybe what if it does create a lot of water? Yeah. So if, if it happens to create a lot of water, or if if we're really trying to keep lots of sink things, there's actually an entire field of study um, in chemistry that's dedicated basically to getting more sig figs. And if you're in analytical chemistry, then yeah, you probably would spend your time to do that. And because you probably are starting with a concentration that has an extra sig, which means you get an extra sig fig here, which means that X, that number winds up making a difference. <clears throat> All right. Well, I think that's about all my voices got left. And there are some more, one more practice problem if you want. This is kind of an interesting one. When you think about iron rusting, it gets less dense, right? And it doesn't, it's not as hard as it used to be when it's rusted out, but the mass actually increases when iron rusts. Um, which is kind of interesting to think about, but here's your reaction for iron rusting. So figure out, here's, this is another good uh, algebra problem. Not nearly as hard as the other one. You have an initial mass of the object, and then you have a final mass of the object. How much of it, what percentage of the iron has reacted? This is just, just more practice. This is a good word problem, though. All right, so also over the weekends or sometime later today or tomorrow, I'll put the practice test up. I'll make that assignment go live so you have the weekend to work on the practice test. Um, and basically, one thing we haven't covered that will be on there a little bit is some gas law stuff. All right, so if you wanted to start working on that, reviewing for the final, um, you're more than welcome to do that. And then we'll have a review day next Thursday, week of the day. Well, if it's not a you can set up left, right? Um, if you can pretty much say during my office hours time on Wednesday. Oh. Yeah. Maybe I'm wrong. Okay, Thursday. Do you want to do Thursday normally? You know, I mean, about very loud time. Okay, okay. All right, so just whatever you decide, shoot me an email so I can put it on my stage. Okay.
Yeah, we'll be there. Okay. 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 Okay.